so hello everybody. We have two announcements for today. One, it's regarding the progress tracking. Uh, so we uh, were flagged by uh, GPs um, regarding your um, your my progress. So for the young your new students, uh, we are talking about the first three points. You already had assigned an advisory chaperone, uh, chairperson. So this will be the chair of your research advisory committee. Now you have to discuss with your supervisor to select the other committee members. Please send us the list of your committee members. And also the first meeting has to be held within three months from the beginning of your studies. So these are for the new students. For the returning students, please keep in mind that you need and you are required to meet minimum once per year until you graduate with your full advisory committee. And when you have this meeting, please fill the progress tracking form, get the signature from everybody and upload it on my progress and inform us to update your file. Otherwise, you're gonna receive emails from the GPS explaining that you are missing some of your progress tracking and that will have probably a, a negative impact on your uh, progress tracking. This is valid only for the master and PhD in the thesis program. Now I'm gonna answer the question in the chat after. We go for the second announcement so we want to start by congratulating the winners for Canada Graduate Scholarship Master Program um, 2022. And in the same time, yesterday you received from Misha an email for uh, the new uh, competition for this year. So please register to the inf info session that takes place on October 20 at 4 p.m. Okay, and you will get all the information. Also, this scholarship, it's mainly for the student in thesis master. So let's see what is the question. Jeffrey, you didn't receive uh, anything that's right yet. Jeffrey? Not yet. Okay, good. I'm going to check with Sharon and we'll let you know. Okay, good. So now we stop with the announcement and we let Faxon present our lecturer today. Uh, you, you could uh, put to share uh, Fabrizio. So it is a pleasure to welcome one of the most brilliant scientists uh, I know. Um, I, I usually meet uh, Dr. Fabrizio Ambrosio at the NIH uh, study section, where we've been uh, standing members for quite a long time. And she's the chair, and she's a brilliant chair, unbelievable. I remember once we co-chaired together, and after a long, exhaustive day, and she's still uh, active, and my brain is like scrambled, uh, unbelievable. Uh, but she does that this uh, almost uh, every uh, study section, uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Ambrosio is an associate professor in the Department of uh, Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School and the inaugural director of the Sporting Research Institute's uh, Atlantic Charter Discovery Center for Musculoskeletal uh, Research. So their mission uh, is the, the discovery of, of the Discovery Center uh, for musculoskeletal recovery is to maximize functional outcomes. So this is for patients who are living uh, with uh, musculoskeletal injury. And uh, towards this mission, uh, Dr. Ambrosio uh, applies her background. So she's got a really varied uh, background, uh, which uh, stems uh, from atomic to clinical uh, levels uh, to cultivate a multidisciplinary environment which is made up a, a team of really uh, committed investigators um, in accelerating scientific discoveries and also trying to uh, intensify uh, translation of, uh, of most of the work that uh, they do. 
and she's been credited with founding a new field. And uh, so, and the field is regenerative rehabilitation. So uh, regenerative re rehabilitation is actually defined as the application of rehabilitation protocols and principles together with regenerative medicine. So it's a marriage between these two fields, which is really uh, interesting um, uh, towards the goal of trying to optimize functional recovery through tissue regeneration, remodeling, or repair. And there's a, a wonderful paper that was published, which you may want to uh, take a look at. I, I went through and it's really, uh, it really uh, tells you what regenerative uh, rehabilitation is all about. So there's a paper which was by Randall and Ambrosio, uh, Cell Stem Cell, which was published in 2018. <clears throat> and so uh, Dr. Ambrosio has published and recorded several educational modules on the topic of regenerative rehabilitation and has assumed international leadership roles to promote the integration of regenerative medicine methodologies, technologies, rehabilitation approaches, uh, etc. And she is the lead director of the Alliance uh, for Regenerative Re Rehabilitation Research and Training, AR3T, which is a, a $10 million NIH funded center that supports for the expansion of scientific knowledge, expertise, and methodologies across the domains of rehabilitation science and regenerative medicine. Uh, actually, her research has been extensively funded by the NIH. And this says a lot because uh, funding is very difficult, uh, especially uh, at, at the NIH, at the R01, and we study, we, we, we sit on these committees, and it's really, really difficult. And both in 2017 and 2018, she was the highest NIH funded investigator of all physical uh, medicine and rehabilitation departments in the US. And Dr. Ambrosio, which means she's loaded. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ambrosio is also the founding course director of the annual international symposium on regenerative rehabilitation and the founding director of the International Consortium for Regenerative Rehabilitation, which includes uh, uh, 17 partnering institutions uh, in North America, in Europe, and in Asia. And in 2022, she was inducted into the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, AMBE, College of Fellows uh, for outstanding contributions to the novel field of uh, regenerative rehabilitation, integrating um, applied physics and uh, cellular therapeutics to optimize uh, tissue uh, function. Uh, Dr. Ambrosio, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Faxon. Um, it is such a pleasure to, to be here and to have this chance to share a little bit about the work in our lab. Um, so Quebec has a very special place in my heart. Um, I, one thing that wasn't mentioned is that I did my Master of Science at, at l'Université Laval um, some time ago, but it really was where I entered into and got into to fundamental skeletal muscle physiology and biology, um, which is really the focus of, of the work that we do now. Um, so, so really a pleasure to, to um, be here and have this time with all of you. So our lab, kind of broadly speaking, has primary research interests in skeletal muscle stem cells and skeletal muscle regeneration. And particularly, we're interested in these um, uh, uh, factors in the context of aging. And so we're interested in understanding molecular and cellular mechanisms by which muscle healing capacity so drastically diminishes uh, with increasing age. And even more than that, we're interested in the development of novel approaches to counteract those declines. So what I'd like to share with you today is some of our recent work um, examining the role of circulating extracellular vesicles in skeletal muscle regenerative cascades and the impact of aging on the information communicated by these vesicles. 
So I think that Claude Shannon, the father of information theory, said it best. And that is that the fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point, either exactly or even just approximately a message at another point. So I think we've all played this game telephone, where one individual comes up with a message that they then go on to pass to a second individual, and the second individual passes it on to the third individual, and so on. And what really makes this game so much fun is that while the intention is to produce through the chain of individuals, the original, original message that was relayed, uh, really this rarely happens. And instead, what we typically see at the end is some kind of a garbled, mixed up message that scarcely remember uh, resembles the one that was originally sent. And so this game, while fun, um, does teach us uh, that um, communication is extremely challenging to relay effectively. In a biological system, effective communication uh, between cells, tissues, and even organs throughout the body is in many ways an, or, uh, an anchor for organismal health. Uh, communication exchange is essential for homeostasis. Um, it's essential for adaptation to ever-changing microenvironments. And communication is essential for initiating a coordinated and effective um, healing response after an acute injury. Unfortunately, defective communication flow is arguably a quintessential feature of an aging system. And it has been suggested that this increasing molecular disorderliness may contribute to tissue and organismal declines over time. So intrigued by this idea then, in recent work, we sought to quantify um, uh, and, and develop a global metric of the growing disorderliness of the aging system. And specifically, we focused on aging skeletal muscle. So for this study, just very briefly, um, essentially what we did is we used a statistical physics approach to estimate the state parameter entropy as a function of gene expression levels from skeletal muscle. In this case, a higher network entropy means a probabilistically greater degree of disorganization or essentially randomness in the system. And so essentially what we found across each of the studies that we accessed, and, and this was RNA sequencing data from skeletal muscle, um, from mice, rats, and humans, what we saw was that uh, entropy reaches a nadir um, somewhere around middle age, after which time entropy gradually increases. Now, this really isn't surprising because, um, you know, I think there's a certain intuition that as we get older, um, entropy increases. Uh, and so this was just kind of a way to quantify that entropy um, from uh, gene expression levels. What was uh, uh, surprising, I think, is that it has been convincingly demonstrated through a number of different studies now that the effects of time's arrow may actually be modifiable and potentially even reversed. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with this um, experimental paradigm called heterochronic parabiosis. Um, it came out, some of the first studies looking at heterochronic parabiosis to study fundamental um, aging biology came out in 2005 out of Stanford University. Um, and essentially it's this very elegant system where investigators sutured together a young animal with an aged animal counterpart. The beauty of this system is that it allowed um, for a circulatory uh, system exchange between the two animals, meaning that the old animal was exposed to blood factors from the young animal counterpart and vice versa. What these investigators showed was that when, when an old animal was exposed to young blood, then this significantly enhanced skeletal muscle healing capacity. And in fact, it restored age skeletal muscle healing capacity to essentially um, youthful levels. There's no free lunch. And so the old animal um, exposed to, or the young animal exposed to old circulating factors displayed a significant decrement in skeletal muscle healing capacity after injury. It's important to note that these investigators were very thorough in their analyses, and they wanted to tease out the possibility of maybe it's 
young stem cells from the young animal that were being transferred through the blood into the old animal um, to elicit this beneficial effects on the regenerative cascade. Um, but they did stem cell lineage tracing experiments and they confirmed that in fact, it was not um, the stem cells that were being transferred. So some other factor within the blood seemed to be responsible for the rejuvenating effect. It's also worthwhile to note that this ex uh, experimental paradigm has been um, since um, used in other contexts to study aging. And so, for example, it's been demonstrated that young blood can significantly in, um, reverse the effects of time on cognitive function of aged animals. Um, it's been shown in, in many different tissues, including um, cartilage uh, and even bone. And so the effects of this youthful circulating um, messages um, to kind of restore enhanced healing capacity and functional potential um, are really seem to be pervasive. And so naturally these studies have uh, really spoken to the potential reversibility of an aging phenotype through circulating factors. And this has, as you can imagine, generated considerable interest by the aging community, including our lab, um, with the goal of really trying to better understand the molecular me mechanisms that underlie these effects. So to date, um, most of uh, the, inve the studies investigating mechanisms underlying the beneficial effects of heterochronic parabiosis on aged tissue function have primarily focused on free circulating proteins. However, a growing number of findings have demonstrated that a large portion of the circulating secretome is packaged within membranous nanoparticles called extracellular vesicles. So extracellular vesicles or EVs are present in fluids throughout the body, um, blood, plasma, serum, saliva, urine. And these extracellular vesicles are intriguing because they traffic between anatomically remote sites and they serve as critical couriers of information. Um, so, so really they play an essential role in systemic communication, again, between different cells throughout the body. So the information then contained within extracellular vesicle is, is, uh, is, is very diverse, and it comes in the form of various proteins, uh, lipids, and genetic materials, including um, mRNA, microRNAs, um, very, as I said, very, very diverse, and, and many different um, components that really comprise and are contained within extracellular vesicle cargoes. But what's interesting and what's really piqued our interest in, in our lab about extracellular vesicles is that there is emerging evidence to suggest that the information um, that is stored within these extra ves extracellular vesicles released by an originating cell into fluids throughout the body, that can these extracellular vesicles can then be taken up by a target cell. And the beauty of this is that these extracellular vesicles can actually regulate physiological functions and or pathophysiological processes within those target cells. So then with this information um, in mind and, and um, considering extracellular vesicles, the question we asked is whether a part, at least a part of the beneficial effect of young blood on aged skeletal muscle regeneration is attributed to circulating extracellular vesicles. So uh, for those of you who don't work in the um, space of skeletal muscle regeneration, I thought I would take just a minute or two to review um, what we know about um, the regenerative cascade. And in fact, this is a very well-described system. Uh, the stem cell was first identified by an Alexander Mauro uh, back in 1961. Um, and, and now we have, have really, um, our, our molecular understanding of the sequence of events that occur in response to an acute injury within skeletal muscle have been very well described. So essentially we have these um, small uh, portion of the total nuclear myonuclear content are comprised of satellite cells. And when I say a small component, that really means about one to 2% of the total myonuclei in a skeletal muscle fiber, as you see here. Under conditions of homeostasis, these stem cells or what are called satellite cells, um, they reside in a state of um, quiescence, so very low metabolic resting state. 
Um, they're so-called satellite cells because they have a very precise anatomic location between the basal lamina and the plasma membrane. And so it almost looks like these satellite cells are orbiting around uh, the muscle fiber. But in response to an acute injury, then these normally quiescent satellite cells uh, become activated and they proceed to a phase of proliferative expansion. So this phase of proliferative expansion is important, as you may guess, because it really serves to amplify the total number of stem cells that are available to participate in the regenerative cascade. Importantly, a small portion, as is really the definition of a stem cell, a small portion of these activated stem cells will go back and reinstate that quiescent stem cell pool. And this is important so that um, we can maintain stem cell numbers um, over time and that there's stem cells available for future rounds of regeneration. But of those proliferating stem cells, then uh, they increase in number. And then eventually what we see is that these uh, stem cells will start to fuse together. So you can see that these um, stem cells in this third panel here are fusing together. Uh, they can either fuse to form new nascent muscle fibers, or they can actually fuse into the damaged muscle fiber. And what's so great about the skeletal muscle regenerative cascade is um, that when all the conditions are right, we see this really nice restoration of the original structure and function of the, the um, damaged myofiber. And so at the, at the end of the day, anatomically and functionally, myofiber regeneration really, or myofiber function really recapitulates um, the original muscle fiber before injury. But as I said, um, this is really the case when all the conditions are favorable and everything is going right. And I'm sure you're not surprised that with aging, um, we see a significant impairment in this regenerative um, uh, potential. And it's really characterized by a failure of the tissue to regenerate that original myofiber structure and function, as well as um, a sort of default um, scar tissue formation at that injury site, which kind of compensates for the, the regenerative um, uh, impairment. And there have been studies um, demonstrating uh, that this, this regenerative impairment really is in large part owing to a defect of the muscle stem cell compartment itself. And so um, in young muscle, what we know is that muscle stem cells have the potential to differentiate into different lineages, um, such as myocytes and myofibroblasts. But in young muscle, what we see is that most of the time, the muscle stem cells will differentiate towards that myofiber regeneration to restore that original myofiber structure. With aging, however, what we see is that the muscle stem cells display this predominance of um, uh, uh, moving towards a myofibroblastic lineage. And so this is um, work out of Tom Rando's laboratory demonstrating that this myogenic to fibrogenic conversion really contributes to the failed myofiber regeneration and the increased scar tissue formation that we see at the injury site of aged skeletal muscle. So then going back to our question then, we wanted to um, evaluate whether extracellular vesicles may play a role in some of this age-related decline in um, regenerative capacity of aged mice. And so um, to do this then, we took aged mice, um, mice that are about 22 to 24 months old, which is the equivalent of about 65 to 70 years old in humans. Um, we took these mice and then um, we administered, um, we randomized them to one of three groups where um, one group received serial um, uh, tail vein injections of just saline. Another group uh, received serial tail vein in injections of young serum. And then the third group received uh, serial tail vein injections of young serum that had been depleted of extracellular vesicles. For this experiment, we uh, followed a protocol that was previously published by Vieta et al., um, also out of Stanford University, where they were looking at the beneficial effects of young blood on cog uh, cognitive capacity in aged mice. And so the, the injection paradigm essentially proceeded um, with injections every three days. Uh, in our paradigm, after 12 days from the start of the protocol, we induced bilateral injuries to the tibialis anterior muscles. And we did this by just injecting a cardiotoxin, uh, which, which promotes myofiber degeneration. 
After 11 days, um, we then evaluated myofiber regeneration and functional force recovery uh, using in situ contra uh, contractile testing um, across, and we uh, compared values across the three groups. This graph on the bottom is just to confirm that when we depleted our young serum of extracellular vesicles, we were able to sign uh, significantly reduce the number of extracellular vesicles in the serum. And so this is nanoparticle tracking analysis demonstrating that greater than 95% of the extracellular vesicles were depleted with, from the serum. So when we looked at um, first myofiber regeneration, um, as, as expected and consistent with the previous work, um, we saw that serial injections of young blood significantly enhanced myofiber regeneration. And here what we're using as our index of myofiber regeneration is cross-sectional area. So the larger the cross-sectional area of the muscle fibers, uh, generally the better the regeneration. So you can see here from these images and then from the quantification on the bottom that um, those old animals receiving young serum injections displayed significantly increased um, um, numbers of um, fire, uh, myofiber cross-sectional area. However, when we removed the extracellular vesicles from the young blood, we saw that that beneficial effect on myofiber cross-sectional area was largely abrogated. And in fact, we saw no difference between those aged animals receiving saline injections and those aged animals that received young serum in which the extracellular vesicles had been removed. We, of course, care a lot about force and, and what is the, the functional relevance of these anatomic findings. Um, so we use a system um, uh, that is an in situ contractile testing system, uh, where essentially we just stimulate the peroneal nerve to induce um, contraction of the anterior compartment muscles, including the tibialis anterior muscle, which is where we had induced our injury. And what we saw here, uh, consistent with the increase in, in uh, myofiber cross-sectional area, is that the force producing capacity of our aged animals that received young blood was significantly higher when compared to saline controls. And so the animals um, receiving young serum are in black and then the saline controls are in blue. But again, um, what we saw is that when we remove the extracellular vesicles from the young serum, then that improvement in force recovery was significantly blunted. And again, we observed no difference between uh, depleted young serum and saline groups. So, so far, the anatomic and functional um, skeletal muscle findings suggest that circulating extracellular vesicles may accumulate at an injury site and participate in active skeletal muscle regeneration. Uh, but we wanted to design a set of experiments to um, test this more directly. And so for this then, in this study, um, what we did is we um, took young serum, again, aged animals and young serum, and we again depleted the young serum of uh, extracellular vesicles. After which time then we uh, repleted the serum with extracellular vesicles that had been isolated and labeled with a fluorescent dye. Um, we again performed tail vein injections of this um, labeled EV uh, young serum into aged animals. And here what we see is that when we compare uh, the aged animals that had received only saline injections, we see that our labeled EVs are indeed accumulating within uh, the skeletal muscle. Um, we see it within both tibialis anterior muscles, uh, uninjured and injured, though the um, extracellular vesicle accumulation at the site of injury was significantly higher when compared to the contralateral uninjured side. Moreover, then, when we wanted to look at the, the tissue level to see where were our, our donor extracellular vessels going, um, what we did is we again took our labeled extracellular vesicles, um, which are here in green, and then we co-localized them with various um, markers of cells within the skeletal muscle. And what we saw was that most of the extracellular vesicles were actually co-localizing with myOD, which we used as a marker of activated muscle stem cells. And so this data then to us suggested that um, circulating EVs, EVs from within the blood, may target activated muscle stem cells at an injury site to promote muscle fiber or muscle regeneration. 
So then um, we decided to turn to an in vitro assay to be able to test this more directly. And essentially this in vitro assay is a marker of, or is, is almost a, um, a model of heterochronic um, blood exchange in vitro. And so here, what we did is we looked at four different groups. Um, we took our aged muscle stem cells that we isolated and we seeded onto our culture dish. And then we, we, we exposed our aged muscle stem cells to one of four conditions, um, young serum, age serum, young serum that had been depleted of extracellular vesicles, and then age serum that had been depleted of extracellular vesicles. Here, what we saw, and consistent with, again, the previous reports, is that exposing aged muscle stem cells significantly enhanced the myogenicity of the aged, um, uh, um, did I say that right? Exposing the aged muscle stem cells to young serum significantly enhanced the myogenicity of the aged cells. Um, and so you can see this here as quantified by a significant increase in this myogenic marker, MyoD. However, when we depleted uh, the, the serum of extracellular vesicles, what we saw was, again, that beneficial effect on, on myogenicity of our aged muscle stem cells was significantly blunted. And again, there really wasn't a difference between those cells exposed to young depleted serum and those cells that had been uh, exposed to aged serum. It's also interesting that there really wasn't much of a difference when we exposed our cells uh, to age serum or age serum that had been depleted of extracellular vesicles. Well, we know uh, from previous work that um, the inability of muscle stem cells to commit to a myogenic lineage is associated with impaired mitochondrial functioning. And so we decided to also um, evaluate cellular respiration across our four groups. And here, when we look at OCR or oxygen consumption uh, rate, what we saw was, again, uh, exposing our age cells to young serum significantly enhanced um, cellular respiration when compared to the other um, experimental groups, including those cells that were exposed to age serum or um, age serum that had been depleted of EVs. And, and indeed, even depleting young serum of extracellular vesicles significantly blunted that enhanced regenerative uh, respiratory effect on our cells. So then this next raised for us the question, uh, what are the molecular mechanisms by which young EV cargos restore a youthful phenotype to muscle stem cells? So um, one fascinating and but still, you know, very mysterious candidate that has been suggested to play a major role in the attenuation of cell and tissue aging is the so-called longevity protein, Clotho. Um, so Clotho was discovered uh, back in 1997 by Kuro O and colleagues, um, and it was a serendipitous uh, discovery because essentially what they found was that um, a mutation in what they now know to be the, the Clotho gene resulted in a drastically accelerated aging phenotype in mice. So of course, mice live on average about three years, but what these investigators demonstrated is that simply um, a, a simple mutation in the Clotho gene led to lifespans in mice only of approximately eight weeks. And it was pretty remarkable because within this eight weeks time, uh, mice displayed a myriad of aging phenotypes from um, sarcopenia or that age-related loss of muscle mass, uh, cognitive dysfunction, cardiovascular dysfunction. Within eight weeks time, essentially what they had were little old mice. Uh, a, a few later, a year, few years after the discovery of the Clotho gene, then they did a very clever experiment where they tried to overexpress Clotho in mice. And um, essentially what they found was that overexpression of the Clotho gene significantly um, enhanced both lifespan and health span by about 30%. Um, so, so these investigators are, are quite romantic because they decided, you know, recognizing this important role of Clotho in, in kind of pro-longevity phenotypes, they named Clotho after the Greek fate that is believed to spin the thread of life. It's important to note here that um, it has been demonstrated that Clotho is also uh, relevant for humans. And so there have been since a number of epidemiological studies demonstrating that Clotho levels in the blood decrease with increasing age, 
And moreover, it's been shown that those individuals who retain high levels of Clotho, even into their older years, uh, display a, a relative protection against um, cognitive declines, skeletal muscle wasting, cardiovascular dysfunction. They have a decreased risk for these pathologies. So again, human relevant, a, a, a very um, interesting and powerful protein. And so recent studies from our work um, conducted you know, several years ago now have also demonstrated that Clotho is a central regulator of muscle stem cell mitochondrial function and skeletal muscle regenerative capacity. And so specifically, we found that young muscle stem cells robustly express and secrete the Clotho protein. And so Clotho here being shown in um, isolated muscle stem cells uh, with the Clotho protein labeled in, in green. Um, but what we saw was that in aged muscle stem cells, there was a significant reduction in Clotho protein levels. And this turned out to be important because what we, we demonstrated through a series of um, gain and loss of function paradigms is that uh, Clotho is important for the maintenance of mitochondrial ultrastructure and integrity and respiration. And so in the presence of Clotho, mitochondria are working well. Um, they um, have high levels of oxygen consumption rate, and this permits the, the cells to progress towards that myogenic lineage, ad adopting myogenic markers such as MyoD, and participating in functional muscle regeneration. But with increasing age, what we saw is that the loss of Clotho contributes to an impaired mitochondrial um, ultrastructure, and it, it triggers this cascade of mitochondrial DNA damage, um, the accumulation of reactive oxygen species, together of which um, drove muscle stem cell stenescence and impaired capacity to participate in um, the muscle regenerative cascade. And so in our laboratory, we're, we're still very interested to understand um, this, this un yet, uh, un, unanswered question as to how exactly um, Clotho seems to be regulating mitochondrial um, ultrastructure, as that is something that is, is still not clear to us. But its role in functional um, mitochondrial uh, respiration seems to be pretty evident. So then we wondered whether circulating extracellular vesicles, rec recognizing that young extracellular vesicles significantly enhance both mitochondrial respiration and uh, uh, myogenicity of the aged muscle stem cells, we wondered whether extracellular vesicles may uh, dictate clotho levels within target muscle uh, stem or progenitor cells. And so here we did um, a same kind of a cold culture experiment where we took aged muscle progenitor cells or MPCs, and we either exposed them to, to, to normal serum um, deprived media or um, uh, young serum um, EVs. And here what we saw was when we looked for the Clotho label within our aged muscle stem cells, we saw that the presence of Clotho protein was significantly increased. We also compared how the aged muscle progenitors would respond to being exposed to either young extracellular vesicles or aged extracellular vesicles. And indeed, this uh, um, our, our uh, data demonstrated that aged extracellular vesicles had a blunted ability to boost those clotho levels within the target cells. So then this raised for us the question as to what are whether the extracellular vesicles may be directly transmitting a clotho signal, or is there something within the extracellular vesicles that is actually triggering the target cells to um, boost endogenous um, clotho gene expression levels? So we thought that a potentially interesting way to answer this question was to use um, the cells from Clotho knockout mice. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the Clotho mutant has this really progeroid accelerated aging phenotype. So even isolating muscle stem cells from these knockouts was extremely difficult, um, but, but we were able to do it. Um, we were able to isolate Clotho knockout muscle stem cells, and then we exposed our knockout muscle stem cells to either vehicle control or young extracellular vesicles. And here what we found is that even when we had the Clotho knockout cells, um, we were able to observe a significant increase in Clotho proteins levels when the cells were exposed to young serum EVs. So this suggested to us that indeed there was something within the uh, extracellular vesicle that is directly being transmitted to the target cell where they're expressing Clotho. 
So perhaps the most linear idea then is to say, to think that um, clotho pro protein levels um, may be that that are observed in the target cells may be just a direct transmission of clotho protein within extracellular vesicles that are then taken up um, by the cells in which we detected in our in vitro assays. But in fact, we found that there was no difference um, in, in um, the clotho protein uh, within extracellular vesicles according to age. And so both young and aged extracellular vesicles had similar levels of uh, clotho protein contained within the cargos. And this was um, really performed using um, uh, SBRI uh, surface plasma and resonance, resonance imaging that was a collaboration with our colleagues at Don Yaki. So then we thought, well, maybe it's not extracellular protein that's being transmitted um, in, in the young extracellular vesicles. Maybe it's actually RNA. And so um, studies by Veladi and colleagues um, performed just a few years ago have demonstrated that extracellular vesicles contain mRNAs that are functional. And so these mRNAs can be taken up by target cells and are capable of being translated in those cells. And so we designed a set of clotho oligonucleotides and used imaging flow cytometry to compare clotho transcript levels in young versus aged DVs. And here we found that indeed there was a significant difference in uh, clotho transcript levels according to age, where our young EVs displayed significantly higher levels of clotho mRNA when compared to aged counterparts. And this also seems to be human relevant. So we took extracellular vesicles from the serum of young versus aged individuals. And again, we looked at clotho transcripts within the circulating extracellular vesicles. And we are clearly underpowered, uh, but with just a handful of samples that we received and that we looked at, um, we did see that also humans um, display significantly lower um, clotho transcripts within the circulating extracellular vesicles. Then to um, evaluate the extent to which the beneficial effect of young extracellular vesicles on muscle regeneration could really be dependent on clotho transcript levels. Here, what we did in this study is we isolated extracellular vesicles from um, animals that were either wild type or heterozygously deficient for clotho. Um, and, and indeed, we we, dem we confirmed that these extracellular vesicles from our clotho het mice had significantly reduced uh, clotho transcript levels. And so aged mice received local injection of either wild type or clotho het EVs. Um, and we injected these EVs three days after injury. We picked three days after injury because this is the time point where um, muscle stem cell activation is really peaking. And so then after another 11 days, we evaluated again, myofiber regeneration and functional testing. And so here, what we found is when uh, we administered uh, extracellular vesicles locally to the injured muscle of our aged animals, we saw that the clotho hets displayed, um, or those animals that received clotho het EVs displayed significantly reduced myofiber cross-sectional area, significantly increased fibrosis, and significantly decreased um, um, specific force recovery after injury. So it does suggest to us that the extracellular vesicles um, perhaps are um, inducing their beneficial effects of muscle on muscle regeneration, in, at least in part through the clotho transcripts contained within. Another way for us to test that is through a gain of function experimental paradigm, where we take um, a, uh, aged extracellular vesicles, and we um, actually engineer these extracellular vesicles to express synthetic clotho mRNA. And so we, we confirm that we can do that, that we can um, engineer our extracellular vesicles to uh, contain clotho transcripts, and that these transcripts can be taken up by target cells to increase in clotho levels. Um, and then we saw that when we did this, um, that aged animals receiving aged EVs engineered with this clo synthetic clotho transcripts display displayed significantly increased uh, myofiber cross-sectional area and a decrease um, uh, fibrosis formation. 
And so these were just some some relatively um, early studies that we performed. Um, we think that there's a lot of potential to extend these studies and really optimize this protocol um, so that we can potentially think about doing this, uh, using this type of delivery a approach as a technology in the future. Um, but taken together then, um, what we concluded from this work is that circulating extracellular vesicles contain contain clotho transcripts uh, within their cargoes, and that these circulating extracellular vesicles can accumulate at the site of an injury and support muscle fiber uh, regeneration. However, uh, with aging, we see a loss of clotho transcripts in extracellular vesicles, and that renders these extracellular vesicles uh, less capable of um, supporting muscle regeneration, thereby um, impeding the myogenic response increasing scar tissue formation, and ultimately decreasing in force recovery after an injury event. So these studies add to an ever-growing body of work that implicates Clotho as playing a major role in the attenuation of aging phenotypes. But for us then, this, this raised another um, major question, and that is, why do we see these um, changes happen in the first place? That is, what what drives a loss of clotho uh, with increasing age? And so um, this was actually a question that was posed by a research fellow at the time, Hirotaka Iijima. Um, we've since been fortunate to, to, to recruit him um, as an assistant professor with our group. Um, but he was very interested, um, given Clotho's pervasive uh, role in attenuation of aging phenotypes throughout the body, Hirotaka was very interested in understanding why this happens. Um, and so Hirotaka had a background in osteoarthritis. So we're going to deviate a little bit um, uh, from skeletal muscle uh, to share this, this very quick story um, in the context of osteoarthritis as a model. Um, so he wanted to build on his previous work in osteoarthritis um, to ask whether Clotho may be playing a role in um, the declines in cartilage integrity that we see over time. And so Hirotaka started by first thoroughly describing um, the progression of cartilage degeneration in um, uh, young, middle-aged, and aged mice. And these ages corresponded to 20 to 30 years, 38 to 47 years, or 56 to 69 years. And here what he demonstrated is that um, the both male and female uh, mice display a significant loss of cartilage integrity over time. Um, and this is evidenced by um, increased surface roughness and a large loss of matrix integrity. Interestingly, um, the, the benefit was uh, blunted in females, which is really surprising because in the clinic, we know that females present with a much more severe um, and a higher incidence of osteoarthritis than males. Um, so we've been doing some work to pursue this, but uh, and I'd be happy to, to dis share that work with you during the discussion if anyone is interested. Uh, but Hirotaka first confirmed that in uh, chondrocytes, the major cell type in cartilage, we see a significant loss of clotho, um, just as we saw in our muscle stem cells. And then he performed um, a comprehensive mass spectrometry uh, proteomics, um, where he was looking to identify potential signaling pathways associated with age and sex-dependent cartilage de degeneration that might be contributing to a loss of clotho and cartilage integrity um, over time. And so um, essentially here in these panels, uh, what Hirotaka did is he converted individual protein changes to keg pathways. Um, and, and so this way he could really identify significant differences in the pathways between the groups. And so any of the pathways that fall within this blue area were significantly different um, according to age. And so what, what we noticed is that uh, Consistent with our, our lack of prominent uh, cartilage changes in females, not many pathways were changing um, in aged female mice. However, in the young, the aged mice, what we male mice, uh, what we saw was this predominance of matrix-associated pathways and mechanotransductive signaling. And so this led us to question whether age-related declines in clotho expression and chondrocyte health may be a consequence of altered mechanical signals from the cartilage extracellular uh, matrix. So for this then, we performed a very simple study where we took uh, naive chondrocytes and we seeded them onto matrices that were either very soft, five kilopascals, 
somewhere in the in between 21 kilopascals or very stiff with 100 kilopascals. And here what we found was that those chondrocytes seated onto stiff um, matrices displayed a significant reduction in clotho mRNA. And we also confirmed that this was um, evident at the protein level. We then um, wanted to evaluate the physiological relevance of these in vitro findings. And so we performed a, another set of in vivo studies where we essentially treated aged animals with BAPN, um, with BAPN being a LOX inhibitor that essentially precludes collagen cross-linking. And therefore, the idea was to decrease matrix stiffness in, of the cartilage um, in our aged mice. And then we wanted to look at whether this might have an effect on cartilage integrity. So this is a, a pretty extensive protocol where the injections proceed um, um, regularly over the course of um, almost a month, after which time we euthanized the mice and evaluated the cartilage. We wanted to first confirm that, um, that the treatment with BAPN uh, induced its desired effect. And in fact, what we saw was that BAPN um, resulted in a significantly decreased matrix stiffness. And this was as determined by atomic force microscopy. Right? microscopy. And essentially, um, our, our uh, BAPN restored um, the matrix stiffness to levels more closely recapitulating young, although I guess um, it, it's actually more in between young and old. It doesn't reduce it all the way to youthful levels. Nevertheless, we saw that in these animals, when we looked at clotho expression within the chondrocytes, we saw that clotho fluorescence intensity was significantly increased in the chondrocytes of those aged animals that had been treated with BAPN. And more importantly, what we saw was that this had um, a direct effect on, um, made, um, on cartilage integrity, where we saw that reducing matrix stiffness uh, significantly enhanced cartilage integrity as, um, as defined by the ORC score, where a higher ORC score um, denotes uh, worse cartilage um, degeneration. So essentially in our BAPN treated aged animals, we saw a, a restoration of a more smoother surface and a restoration of what we would expect in a more youthful um, cartilage uh, matrix. So then uh, to summarize then, um, this, was, this was just a little bit of a snapshot of um, some of the work that we did, again, trying to get at this question as to why we lose um, cartilage expression, or, uh, clotho expression with increasing age. And from this work using cartilage as a model, our data suggests that um, with increasing age, uh, we see an increase in matrix stiffness, something that is really um, a hallmark of aging in tissues throughout the body. And that this increased matrix stiffness uh, drives a loss of, of clotho uh, levels, um, clotho gene expression levels, which we demonstrated in this paper to be epigenetic uh, regulation of clotho. And that, uh, that this loss of clotho is associated with an increased uh, cartilage degeneration. So as a next step for these studies, then we're very curious to know whether similar mechanisms may be driving a loss of clotho in other systems, um, for example, in the brain, where uh, we know that clotho ex expression has been shown to be essential for the maintenance of cell and tissue health. And then also, as I mentioned, we're, of course, very interested in thinking in, in asking whether this is potentially relevant to muscle, um, because indeed, in previous work, we have demonstrated that an age related uh, increase in muscle matrix stiffness um, helps to contribute to that myogenic to fibrogenic conversion, where our muscle stem cells seated on a stiff surface actually had a predisposition to differentiate towards that myofibroblastic lineage. So this will then bring me to just um, a few slides that I'd like to share that are, are really preliminary work, um, because the work that I just demonstrated in the context of cartilage kind of highlights how um, aberrant mechanical signaling pathways can trigger pathogenic cascades to compromise tissue health, and that at part this seems to be um, uh, uh, associated with uh, regulation of clothogene expression. 
But I come from a rehabilitation background myself, and so I'm always interested in understanding and exploring whether and how we can use um, the application of targeted and specific mechanical stimuli to harness endogenous tissue healing capacity. So, um, of course, one of the best anti-aging interventions uh, that we know of is exercise. Um, and it's really been quite remarkable to us as we've learned more about Clotho and then leveraging our background in exercise to see the many overlapping functions of Clotho and exercise. And indeed, we know that um, mechanical forces are, are potent uh, modulators of cellular health, that mechanical forces coming from the uh, microenvironment can induce powerful changes in gene expression and the ability of a cell to differentiate. And this is in the world of, of uh, biomechanics and bioengineering, of course, goes back decades. Something we know less about, however, is whether mechanical forces can similarly affect um, extracellular vesicles that are released and the cargoes contained within. So again, within um, just these last few slides, I'd like to share with you this story um, that was led by Allison Bean and Amrita Sahu, um, two now assistant professors, um, both at the University of Pittsburgh, um, but they were really ones to, to lead these studies. And, and here we were asking whether skeletal muscle activity modulates clotho cargos within extracellular vesicles. So for this then, um, we used our model of neuromuscular electrical stimulation, which induces a muscle contraction to the anterior compartment muscles, again, including the tibialis anterior. And so this is a non-invasive and cl clinically uh, relevant approach for inducing muscle contraction. So we did two weeks of neuromuscular electrical stimulation to aged mice, and then we isolated extracellular vesicles from either aged mice or aged mice that had undergone um, uh, electrical stimulation or NMES. We again injected extracellular vesicles three days after injury in aged mice and evaluated functional testing after 11 days. And here what we saw is that when we transplanted extracellular vesicles following two weeks of electrical stimulation, then we, there was a significant improvement in the force um, recovery of those aged animals. When we returned to our in vitro paradigm and we seeded our aged muscle progenitor cells with either HDVs or HDVs exposed to NMES, we saw a significant increase in clotho protein levels. And we also saw when we looked at clotho mRNA levels within our HDVs that two weeks of electrical stimulation significantly enhanced those clotho transcript levels within the HDVs um, above and beyond the clotho transcript levels that we had seen in just the control sedentary aged mice. So this really, I think, is um, just one example of um, this regenerative rehabilitation paradigm where uh, we're, we're looking to bring together advances in regenerative biology, regenerative medicine, together with that of rehabilitation, uh, rehabilitative medicine. And so this is really an area that we um, are, are starting to apply, uh, not only within skeletal muscle, but within a number of different uh, tissues throughout the system. So with that, then, I want to um, thank, um, in particular, the Alliance for Regenerative Rehab Research and Training, which is our NIH-funded center to support um, uh, research and education in this area. I want to mention that we are having our 10th annual uh, Symposium on Regenerative Rehabilitation, um, which will be held uh, at um, Harvard Medical School in March of next year. So I welcome all of you to join us. Uh, we actually have a lot of funds in, um, available for travel awards. So we have about $20,000 in travel awards, and we love to support um, trainees and young investigators who might be interested in this area of science. Of course, I want to thank um, our collaborators and the funding um, that has supported this work. I want to thank my magnificent laboratory. I'm very fortunate to, to work with these individuals. And of course, I want to thank you for your time and attention. Uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fabrizia, for that uh, really wonderful uh, presentation. I, I like the way you uh, give this uh, really straightforward and, and uh, uh, clear um, uh, uh, experiments and uh, and then non-ambiguous 
uh, kind of uh, results. Really brilliant. Thank you very much. Excellent. Appreciate that. So um, we have, uh, please feel free to either unmute and ask or just uh, um, you can write in the chat. Um, so we, anyone wants to ask? We, we have a question okay. in the chat from Mashid. How can we deplete extracellular vesicles out of serum? So thank you for, for, for bringing that up. I didn't want to go into the details, but it, it, it's a very important point and something that um, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, for our paper. Uh, so essentially what we did is we used um, uh, um, an ExoQuick. It's a commercially available um, uh, assay where we can deplete um, the extracellular vesicles using a po polymer bead um, type of approach. In general, ex uh, ExoQuick is not great for isolating extracellular vesicles um, because it's been shown that it actually depletes other um, things and not just extracellular vesicles. So it's a little bit messy if you want to evaluate just the extracellular vesicles themselves. And so this was something that we were worried about. We were worried about maybe when we were doing the depletion protocol that we were depleting something else um, that was actually responsible for the effect. Uh, we were also concerned that using this exoquick protocol, we um, might be adding some type of toxicity to the remaining serum. And so that could have potentially um, also increased the differences between our groups. Um, so to rule that out, essentially what we did is we took, uh, we compared three different groups, cells that had been treated with young serum, cells that had been treated with young depleted serum using this exoquick protocol, and then um, cells that had been treated with young serum that was depleted of the extracellular vesicles through exoquick, but then restored uh, column isolated extracellular vesicles. And so size exclusion chromatography is really the gold standard for um, a gold standard for uh, isolating extracellular vesicles. And so there we get a much more purified population. And indeed, what we saw when we restored um, the serum with these column isolated EVs, then we brought back um, the response of the cells to levels that were very compa uh, comparable to untreated uh, young serum. And so that's how we felt a little bit more comfortable that the depletion protocol itself was not detrimental. So I think uh, you probably have addressed the next question by Lily, who also asked, uh, how can we avoid depleting the soluble proteins? Yeah, it, it, it's definitely uh, a, an issue, um, but but that's how how we we did it. Um, just you know, re um, replenishing this the depleted serum with the purified extracellular vesicles, where we saw that restoration of the beneficial effect of young serum helped us. It, it's not to say that we're not um, with the depletion protocol. We're not. Um, you know, also depleting some other proteins, but it doesn't seem like those proteins, if they are depleted, um, that they're exerting the 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 lion's share of the the benefit that we see. Um, we very much would like to to isolate the stem cells and admit. Uh, I'm sorry, extracellular vesicles, and look at just um, applying those um, by by tail vein and direct um, transplantation. Is I think that's a much more direct measure. Yeah, so there's a next question by Razan Yassin Kassab. We, uh, thank you. As a result of the first study, less cloth of messenger RNA in aged EV lead to increased scarring and strength. The, the question is, is there any product that play a role in solving this problem to use in aged patient post-injury? Yeah, so it's it's actually something we are very interested in. Um, and in fact, we, we have a, a patent pending uh, for the use of extracellular vesicle engineering. It's 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 a great um, a great comment because that's exactly what we're thinking about is whether we can use extracellular vesicle engineering as a means to support um, skeletal muscle regeneration in older and in individuals. Uh, but also we think about it for other applications. And in particular, we've been directing our attention to the brain. Um, so I mentioned that Clotho is very important for brain health. Um, and there are studies that have demonstrated that young blood do um, does in fact enhance uh, cognitive function in aged animals. 
Uh, I didn't share it with you, but we actually just published a paper with our colleagues who study the brain. And we demonstrated a very similar paradigm where if we um, deplete young blood of extracellular vesicles, then we essentially um, a blunt, we significantly blunt the beneficial effect of that young blood for the brain. And so what we're thinking about specifically in the context of EV engineering is whether we can engineer extracellular vesicles with tr clothotranscripts that we think are beneficial for um, uh, brain health. Um, and, and this is particularly advantageous because we know that extracellular vesicles readily cross the blood brain barrier. And that has been a major um, obstacle in the development of therapeutic approaches um, for, for the brain. And so we think that extracellular vesicles may be an interesting alternative. So, so the, the next question uh, seems to be, uh, it seems to that the the EVs, the total is seem to, uh, to be packaged in these EVs. I think the question is uh, asking, how did you purify the specific clothal positive EVs? Um, so we actually um, um, generated a clotho specific um, probe. Um, that attaches onto clotho mRNAs uh, within the extracellular vesicles. And then we used imaging flow cytometry. Um, so for anyone not familiar with imaging flow cytometry, it's essentially flow cytometry that allows us to take a picture and quantify, um, in this case, clotho um, levels at the resolution of single nanoparticles, or in our case, um, single uh, extracellular vesicles. And so we can actually get a sense of how many um, clotho transcripts are in, um, in the various extracellular vesicles within uh, the population. And so that's the way that we, we quantified it in, in our lab. Um, we did try to use a digital PCR as well, but we had a really, really difficult time. So that, that turned out not to, to work so well for us. So, so how how does clotho interact with other aging uh, key cellular pathways that are involved in aging, such as uh, Wnt, IGF, mTOR? Is there some sort of interaction, or is it uh, working solo? No, no. Um, so, so great question, Faxon, because uh, actually it's been shown. And the reason we got interested in clotho in the first place is because um, it's been shown to inhibit wind signaling activation. And so we thought that that was very interesting because that same um, paper that I, I, I shared uh, out of Stanford University that demonstrated that aged muscle stem cells undergo that my myogenic to fibrogenic conversion. Um, that paper demonstrated that that was in large part owing to um, wind signaling essentially running amok. So wind signaling um, was very, very high in aged muscle stem cells and that, that contributed to uh, the myogenic to fibrogenic conversion. So that's what got us thinking about Clotho was because of its role in inhibiting wind signaling activation. Um, but Clotho has also been shown to um, inhibit IGF signaling. And so we think in terms of its its role and, you know, kind of this anti-aging pro-longevity, pro it's certainly through um, uh, IGF signaling as well. Um, as I mentioned, we're very interested in looking at some of the molecular mechanisms by which Clotho is regulating mitochondrial function because we really don't know how that's happening. Um, but but that's, you know, kind of some, some directions for, for the future. So I imagine Clotho is, uh, comes in different flavors um, as isomer. Um, so do you, do you, when you are talking about Clotho, which one are you talking? Is it the alpha or the beta? So um, yeah, that's a, a great point for clarification. Um, so just to, to, to back up a little bit in terms of Clotho. So uh, Clotho is primarily um, expressed in the kidney and also the choroid plexus of the brain are the two highest, uh, but primarily the, the, the kidney. And in the kidney, it um, is a transmembrane form. And so what essentially happens is that the extracellular portion of clotho, the transmembrane form of clotho, it's, um, it's cleaved and then released into uh, the, the, the circulation. Um, and so the cleavage, it's really the cleavage product that exerts its systemic, you know, kind of hormonal effects. Uh, the one that we're very interested in is the alpha clotho um, version. And so it's alpha clotho specifically that has been associated with that um, aging, you know, 
accelerated aging phenotype. Um, the beta, there's other, there's other versions, beta, there's a lot less known about beta clotho than um, alpha clotho. Uh, beta clotho seems to be um, more involved in things like uh, lipid oxidation. So, so a different, more metabolic role. Uh, Mike, a oh, question. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Th thanks again for accepting our invitation. Fantastic work, actually. It's very incredible how far you came with uh, understanding the role of COPO and even the serum transfer and muscle regeneration from young to old. It reminds me actually a little bit of the uh, it's kind of a morbid tale, but of the Hungarian Countess uh, uh, Elizabeth Bathory, right, who used to bathe in blood of virgins to preserve her youth <laughs> oh yeah the, the media gets a heyday they love invoking vampires maybe the vampires yeah. what they were doing for sure <laughs> yeah so, yeah a few questions so really it's a, a follow-up on Paxson's question a little bit on clotho um yeah so you mentioned uh, a little bit of the processing so you're dealing of course with the soluble form so is, are there any changes in the proteases that clear? Because in following the soluble form, there's a, there's several uh, forms of um, cleavage, right? Or several mm -hmm. protease cleavage sites, I guess, that are involved before the active form is finally released. So are there changes in the enzymes that are responsible for that in the older, in the aged uh, uh, mice versus the younger? Um, I, I don't know that... Um... The answer to that, if if it's if some of the you're saying the age related declines, um, whether yeah, it is exactly. a, a result in, in a processing, yeah, um, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, but but what I didn't share, and uh, you know, just for the sake of not going into too much detail and, and taking up too much time, is that we see that there is um, epigenetic re repression of the clotho promoter in the context of a stiff matrix. And so we think that that may, it, 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 is, it does seem to be that epigenetic regulation of clotho is critical. And so for example, um, what we see in, in skeletal muscle, again, I didn't show all this data, but um, when we have a young muscle that is acutely injured, we see clotho levels go way up at three days, seven days, and back down, you know, after a week or, or even 14 days after injury. Um, but what we see is that um, clotho levels are pretty much the same in a, acute skeletal muscle with aging. And so um, what our data suggest in muscle, and then I think is supported by our cartilage work, is that it seems to be a dis, uh, uh, um, dysregulated epi, epi, epigenetic um you know, it's it's demethylation of the clotho promoter that occurs in young animals in response to an acute injury event. And that epigenetic regulation seems to be lost with aging. And so we have a lot to to under, yet understand about that, but that's really where we've been kind of focusing a lot of our energy. Amazing, yeah, thank you. Um, what if, so another question, when you did the, um, related to clotho, so when you did the recovery assay, um, using BATNA on the uh, samples cartilage in the aged mice, and you found that the stiffness, right, improved clotho expression, mm -hmm. and that improved the OA. Did you see any changes in osteophytes in the aged animal? Um, we didn't look at osteophytes um, uh, uh, specifically in the... Um, in the cartilage, in the BAPN, we only did the ORC scoring. And, you know, actually there, um, the, the limitation is that we did see with BAPN, we saw an increase in clotho in our chondrocytes, and we saw an increase in cartilage integrity. But we, we didn't have any experiments to directly link the two. So it would have been great if we could have, um, you know, decreased matrix stiffness, but inhibited or, you know, continued to, to repress uh, clotho expression to see if then um, we don't no longer get the beneficial effect on the cartilage. We did parallel studies in vitro where we put our cells, for example, on a stiff uh, a soft substrate, our age cells on a soft substrate, we saw that clotho went up. Um, but then when we inhibited um, clotho, what we saw is that, you know, those chondrogenic markers were decreased. So there we were able to more directly implicate um, uh, clotho expression. 
but in our in our um in in our in vivo models it was actually pretty pretty superficial we didn't go um mm -hmm. too extensive either into the characterization or um into linking directly clotho and and cartilage um structure mm -hmm. sure kind of a circular um, to your question but i hope yeah you exactly you know <laughs> it's fine <laughs> uh, and this one's are related more to the muscle so in the muscle regeneration uh, in your NEV model from young to old using serum NEVs. Uh, what type, uh, did you see any increase in blood vessel uh, development or blood vessel growth in the um, in the aged animals when you did the injury model and injected the, uh, the serum? Um, so it's a very insightful question because uh, Clotho has been shown to play an important role in angiogenesis. And likewise, mm -hmm. um, uh, vascular supply, capillary density is very tightly linked with um, muscle stem cell numbers. In fact, there's a, a beautiful paper back from 2007 that kind of demonstrates how capillaries and muscle stem cells in the tissue kind of go, go hand in hand. And if you decrease vascular supply, you decrease muscle stem cell numbers and vice versa. Um, but we, we actually didn't look at... Um, um, vascular supply specifically. I mean, I think we we have the tissues. It is something that we could go back yeah. and look at again. It would be interesting to see. Sure, yeah. And last one, sorry to push this, is the, the type of fibers. So when you see the muscle regeneration in the old, what type of fiber, did you get the type of fibers that are developed um, when you did the injury model, like during the repair? Yeah. Is it like so type one, two, like what uh, is, can you, is that in any way that so it is an interesting question. Of course, um, you know, the, the physiological um, uh, uh, background in me really, um, and as a matter of fact, that's that's really what I did at Let Laval was um, I, I looked at fiber type switching in response to under under different conditions. Um, you know, in, in mice, the, the, the fiber typing is um, not as evident as it is in humans. And so, for example, in, in um, our tibialis anterior muscles, we don't see that much variation um, under, under normal conditions. And so, so we really haven't focused in on that fiber type um, under, under our various uh, conditions. Um, I think it would be interesting to, to, to look at a little bit more deeply. Um, I'm just not sure about the model and how closely it mimics mm -hmm. um, human, human differences in, in, um, um, fiber typings in 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 muscles, so it's a, a little bit more challenging. We we've struggled a bit with um, trying to detect differences in in fiber types in our young and aged, and according to sex. Well, thanks again. Thanks for answering the questions. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, uh, is that a, a new hand or or you have a hand? <laughs> Do you have any question? Yeah. Uh, hi, Dr. Ambrosio. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, I'm just curious that how would you interpret the finding that the the young cells pack the messenger RNAs of Clozo in their EVs and to target other cells instead of packing the proteins or maybe microRNAs? So yeah. it's not really a like, uh, question have the specific answers, but I would like to like hear your discussions. It's a it's a great discussion point. So um, one of the things that I didn't demonstrate is um, how how we 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 thought about um, clotho transcripts in the first place. And so before we um, before we did any uh, interrogation into the molecular cargos of young versus aged DVs, um, we had seen that there was a difference in in the functional um, role on our target cells, and we had seen that young EVs increase clotho levels within the target cells. Um, so recognizing the functional differences and, and effects of the EVs on the target cells, the first thing we did was Raman spectroscopy analysis. And so um, Raman spectroscopy analysis gave us this opportunity to kind of look from a very global view at the molecular content of our EVs, young versus old. And so um, when we did this um, um, Raman spectroscopy, we can actually group um, and the differences in the molecular cargo according to age, 
And then we can group it by family. And so we could say broadly, um, what do the proteins look like, young versus age DVs? What do the nucleic acids look like? We can't say, say anything specific, but we can say broadly. And this, these Raman spectroscopy findings for us demonstrated that, in fact, when we compare young to old EVs, proteins across the board were pretty much un, the same. So we saw the same levels of proteins in, in young versus age DVs. Uh, nucleic acids, however, were pretty different. And what we saw was that nucleic acid uh, content in our young EVs was just generally much, much higher than uh, when compared to the aged EVs. And so then when we got to these, you know, dig, trying to dig deeper into the, the cargoes of the EVs and, and how we, this might be explaining the differences, that's why we de decided to hone in on mRNA. Um, and so, so, you know, we, now why, why that is, why is it that with increasing age, we don't really see a difference in, in protein cargoes and why do we see such a difference in nucleic acids? Um, actually lipid content is another area that we're very interested in because lipid content is uh, significantly increased in aged EVs. So there seems to be a switch. Um, but it's a really interesting and important question as to what is dictating um, how these EVs are, are being, um, you know, deciding on their cargoes. Uh, we know it's a reflection of the originating cell. Uh, but one of the things we don't know is the EVs that we're looking at, um, what are their means of biogenesis? And so EVs have, can be um, made many different ways, for example, budding of, of um, the, the, the membrane, you know, they can just bud off like an apoptotic body and be released or, you know, through, through some of these um, endosomal pathways. And so we, in the EVs that we're looking at, we don't really know what the beneficial, uh, what the, the biogenesis is and, and what are the mechanisms. And that's why I refrain from calling them, for example, exosomes or, um, you know, some other types of, of, of EVs, EVs kind of catch all. Um, but I suspect that um, the difference in cargoes that we're seeing um, may be a reflection of bio, uh, biogenesis mechanisms. Um, so, so it'd be interesting to look at it in more deep, deeply and understand why we're seeing these difference in clotho transcripts. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I... Uh... Your, this is really brilliant, uh, really wonderful. Your work on, on osteoarthritis is really fascinating. I have a zillion questions on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I went through it quickly, but I wanted to kind of share a little bit of the story. Yeah, it just, uh, uh, you know, it would be interesting to know, because osteoarthritis, uh, it's regarded as a, 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 a disease of the whole joint. Mm -hmm. So. It, Interesting. I know you you looked at chondrocyte. Uh, it would be interesting to look at uh, what uh, the where it's mostly expressed. Is, is synovium? Is, is it the bone? Is it the cartilage? Uh, and how that changes with uh, since you do mechanotransduction, transduction, and how that changes with exercise. And that would be really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's something where it's it's a new area for our lab, but I it has definitely captivated me, and and I'm I'm very interested in kind of extending these studies into further projects. Right. Can I ask uh, some question? Two yeah. two two question. Hi. Hello, hi, uh, Fabrizia. My name is Chen. I'm the PI at the McGill, and also I'm a physiatrist at the McGill. And um, so I have a I, my research is in the area of the spinal cord injury. I'm particularly interested into the heterotopic ossification. And um, also in our pra clinical practice, we also know that aging is always related to the calcific change. Mm -hmm. And so now more and more people think that calcific uh, calcification is actually an active ossification pro pro process. Mm -hmm. And so do you think the aging process and abnormal calcification is somehow tied up and linked to the clotho signaling. Oh, um, hmm. 
That's it's really interesting. So um, certainly um, bone pathology with in, in the clotho knockout animals was one of the first um, pathologies that were observed. And so clotho does um, play an important role in mineral homeostasis. I know, I don't know much about, about the literature. I, I do know it's a, a rich literature base and there is a lot um, discussing or, you know, discussing it. But um, so, so in that way, I would imagine that indeed, um, um, it, it seems very likely that um, Clotho may be mediating some of the effects um, of aging on, um, you know, osteogenic um, and, and um, HO um, deposition. Um, I, like I said, I don't know that literature specifically, but it does seem like there would be um, a very interesting and important link there. And um, so there's one more question about the muscle injury you use is a cardiotoxin injection. Mm -hmm. And so as far as I know, the cardiotoxin injection specifically target on the mild side. Mm -hmm. But is that uh, is there any like a better mus uh, muscle injury mo model available? Because as my my Michael mentioned that the aging related change re relate to the vessels, relate to the nerves. It's a comprehensive change. It's not only the muscle get injured. Yeah. Um, so so that's a great point. And you know, we like so the advantage of the cardiotoxin. Um, injury model is that we um, can induce an injury that is pretty reproducible uh, because, you know, these, these injury models, you know, even at baseline young, and then way more with aged animals, we see such a, a difference in um, performance and muscle strength um, across aged animals, um, even in the absence of injury. And so then we add another injury on top of it that really makes the system noisy. So we like cardiotoxin inje injection because we can be pretty consistent in terms of the amount of, um, uh, you know, um, cardiotoxin that we're injecting, and then hopefully having a, a pretty consistent or at least as consistent as possible um, means of inducing an injury. As you said, though, um, the, the cardiotoxin injury, it essentially causes degradation of the myofibers while retaining uh, the neighboring cell populations intact. Uh, for our models, that's good because then we can actually um, measure the stem cells that are there, the other progenitor cells like fiber depogenic progenitors that could also be contributing and that we know play an important role in the, the regenerative cascade. Um, so those cell populations are main, maintained intact with, um, with our injury model. So there's that advantage. Um, but as you said, the disadvantage is that it's not really uh, an injury that is as clinically relevant. Um, so there are models of, for example, eccentric induced um, mm. injury, where I think they have a mouse uh, running uh, downhill. And so that's that's one way to do it. Um, there are laceration injuries. Um but again, you know, we, we, we've chosen the, the cardiotoxin just mostly because of the reproducibility and because of the fact that it, it maintains the cell populations pretty much intact. Okay, thank you. For sake of the time, I'm going to stop my question. Sure. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Fabrizio. As you can see, we can't stop asking your questions. Oh, these have been great questions. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> That's how excited we are. Um, so really, thank you very much uh, for that great talk, and uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to come and uh, give us uh, this really wonderful uh, presentation. Um, so, and thank you for coming, and uh, really appreciate. Uh, so, so have uh, a wonderful week, everyone, and uh, Fabrizia, enjoy Boston. Thanks. <laughs> and feel free to reach out to me if anyone has any more questions, send me an email. If anyone's interested in our symposium, send me an email. I, I, um, I'm, I'm working with those travel awards, so I'd love to see some people from McGill. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank, Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>